Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 320 for the 13th of Tishrei in a leap year. So I've mentioned on the podcast previously that I don't tend to watch a lot of movies or TV shows or things like that. However, once in a while, I do tend to come across a movie or a show that I find to be really interesting, really fascinating, and um, something that kind of sticks in my mind. And one such movie, or rather documentary, that fits into this category is a documentary called Kumare. It's a fascinating documentary, and I don't actually want to give away too much of it because it's it's kind of like as it unfolds, there's like surprises that come, come along the way throughout it. Uh, but the basic premise of the documentary and what it's about is that it's based around this guy who is uh, of Indian origin from India, and he comes from a religious family, a religious Hindu family, but he himself is quite secular, and he does not, um, he does not, believe in anything religious and in fact he feels quite disillusioned with the whole guru culture that he grew up with in India and he feels very strongly that most if not all gurus are actually frauds and he seeks out to prove this so what does he do how does he go about doing this is he actually sets out to make himself into a guru like to dress up like a guru and pretend that he is a guru a founder of some religion and show the world how easily it is to uh, to trick people and to start a cult basically. So he actually does this. The advantage that he has is he he has a good, he's, he's very tall. So that's kind of like a gift that he has in this because people, research has shown that people, a lot of CEOs tend to be really tall. People kind of naturally tend to respect taller people. But aside from that, what he does, I mean like in his regular life, he wears regular clothes, he has regular hair and everything, but he actually grows out his beard really long and he grows his hair really long so that he, and he, you know, he's Indian. So he has that dark, uh, dark face and he uh, he moves out to the middle of nowhere somewhere in America uh, maybe it was Tennessee or something I don't remember maybe Arizona it might have been Arizona I don't remember offhand and he starts speaking in a thick Indian accent and he invents this whole religion this whole philosophy and he calls himself Kumare he gives himself this title of Kumare and lo and behold he actually builds up a following and I'm going to leave it here. I, if you're interested in seeing what happens throughout the documentary, I, I highly recommend this documentary because it is really fascinating on many different levels. And it actually, to me, actually comes out with a lot of depth, a lot of things that kind of like parallel Hasidus in a lot of ways. I could do a whole episode actually like dissecting, dissecting this documentary, but I won't do that right now because it's not super relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. But the main points that I want to bring out from this documentary is just this idea of what this guy noticed and what he actually was correct about is that there's this natural tendency that humans have to seek out gurus, to seek out people who will kind of alleviate their suffering, who will give them answers to their pain, to give them answers to life. We see this everywhere. People seek out fortune tellers, people seek out astrologers, you know, all kinds of different things like that, r different religions and cults and stuff like that. And indeed, many of these people, unfortunately, are very fraudulent. Some people might not be fraudulent. Some people might be quite wise, right, and might actually have some wisdom to, the wisdom to them. However, the message of what we're going to be learning about today, and we're going to be learning a new epistle today, in Igar Sakodesh of the Alter Rebbe is that Chabad Hasidus specifically, which was the type of Hasidus that was established by the Alter Rebbe, was actually, the Alter Rebbe wanted to kind of combat this guru worship, this, this natural tendency people have to worship gurus of any types, even 
people like himself, even very wise Torah scholars. He obviously he felt that there was a need to have Torah scholars and that there is there's a, a place for Torah scholars. There's a place for a Rebbe, obviously, insofar as you go to a Rebbe for spiritual concerns, for advice in your spiritual service and how to serve God and stuff like that. But what he found, what the altar Rebbe found is that he was getting bombarded with all kinds of different letters and requests about all kinds of mundane physical things, about how to make a living, about where to live, how to marry off a child, all kinds of things like this. And really, as we've spoken about previously, one of the primary reasons why the Tanya was actually written down as a book was as a way to kind of like deal with all of these requests that the ultra was being bombarded with. Like he just in, in the be- very beginning years of, of the Hasidus of the Hasidus of the ultra Rebbe, then he would actually receive these fo- his followers on a one, one to one basis. And he would actually sit down and mentor them or sometimes in small groups, but at a certain point, it just became, the following became too large and it just became unsustainable. So the idea of the Tanya, the written form of the Tanya that we've been learning in this podcast was really written down as a way to systematize these different answers that the altar Rabbi gave, his teachings that he would give, because he started to see that, that many of the questions that were coming up were often very recurring and issues that people were grappling with were often very similar. And so he said, you know what, rather than answering each person individually, which is very time consuming and it's also not very sustainable, especially if we're thinking about like generations to come. He said, I'm going to write down these these commonly, it's like a, an FAQ, frequently asked, asked questions in terms of, of serving God. What are the most frequently asked, asked questions that his followers tended to have? And so today's epistle is actually an epistle that is somewhat, at least it begins this way, as a little bit of like, almost like kind of like a rebuke, which is interesting because most of the epistles that the Ultra Rebbe wrote were written more in like a loving kind of way. And indeed, this one does begin with, with words of loving as well. Like the, he, the Ultra Rebbe begins and he, he addresses his chassidim, his followers as my beloved brethren and, and friends. So he's speaking in a very loving manner, but the message is really a rebukeful one. What's the message of today's Chatanya? The message of today's Tanya that we're going to learn is that the Altar Rebbe is pleading with his Chassidim to not bother him with these mundane requests, these physically based worldly requests. And he says that this is these, these types of questions that people are coming to him with that have to do with worldly matters. It's not appropriate to be asking a Torah scholar these kind of things. These things are not the realm of a Torah scholar. The realm of these physical matters, he says, this is the realm of profits. This is something that a prophet can see in terms of how much money are you going to make? Who are you going to marry? You know, stuff like that. But going to a scholar such as the Alter Rebbe, his realm, his expertise is in the realm of serving God. It's about things that have to do with spirituality and devotion to God, but not really about these mundane matters. So this like tendency that his chassidim had to go to him with all these kind of different things, the altar Rebbe is kind of saying like, please don't, don't bother me with these kind of things. And the deeper implication of this here is the idea that Chabad chassidus in, in general, like the whole idea of the establishment of Chabad chassidus and what, and the uniqueness of Chabad is that the whole idea of Chabad, Chachma bin Adas, is that there's an intellectual component to the Chassidus. And what the Altar Rebbe specifically, who found the founder of Chabad Chassidus, what he was hoping to impart to his Chassidim is the intellectual tools to be able to figure things out on their own. To, yes, you, ha- you have a Rebbe, and there's a specific role for a Rebbe for sure, but that role of the Rebbe is there to help you as a spiritual guide to a certain extent, but not to hold your hand the whole way while you just like kind of follow along blindly. You're supposed to be an active participant and you're, his, he wanted his chassidim to be actively involved, actively using their minds, actively really ingraining the chassidus into the into their intellects, into their understandings in such a way that they could actually figure things out on their own as well. And this is really what makes Chabad Chassidus so unique. And this is kind of like the difference between just going a little bit off, ta- off topic here, a little on a tangent, but related at the same time. When you look at different groups of Chassidim, like Chabad is just one group of Chassidim. There are many different other styles of Chassidim. And they all tend to have different kind of gatherings that <clears throat> revolve around the Rebbe. Uh, within 
the world outside of Chabad Chassidus and different types of Chassidim, what they tend to have very often is something called a tish. A tish is in, in Yiddish, it means a table. And what that is, is that all the Chassidim will sit around a table and then you'll have the Rebbe sitting at the top, at the head of the table and everybody's there and they're all participating in this tish and the Rebbe and, and there's food and the Rebbe has a plate of food and the Rebbe eats from the food and then little pieces of the Rebbe's food is passed around to the Chassidim so that they could all partake in the Rebbe's food. And this is um, and this is thought to be a very auspicious thing to do because you're getting a piece of this holy Rebbe. And this is an amazing thing, right? It's like here's this very, very holy man and he's sitting at the head of the table and we are all aspiring to even have like some semblance of this holy man in our lives. And so by having a little piece of his food, this is a way that we can connect to the Rebbe, connect to this holiness in this way. So this is a very special thing. And I don't want to downplay the power of a Tish and, ha- and the specialness of this. But by contrast, what the Rebbe instituted was this idea. And what we set- see in the world of Chabad Chassidus, by contrast, is not, we don't call it a Tish, but we actually call it a Fabrengen. What's a Fabrengen? Fabrengen is the idea of a gathering. And while, yes, there were times when the Rebbe would distribute little bits of his wine, you know, let's say, or he would distribute lekach, honey cake to his chassadim and those kind of things. So there, there was an aspect of that, of the, of the Rebbe doing that. But the focus was really on this idea of a Fabrengen. A Fabrengen is a gathering. And we're, it's sort of like it's, it wasn't so much about us all sitting there and trying to get a piece of the Rebbe and kind of like all just like sitting there and like looking up to the Rebbe. But the, but the idea was that the Rebbe was actually trying to impart so that all of his Hasidim would become many Rebbe's themselves, would become leaders themselves, which is the idea of shluchas, the idea of shluchim, right? You have shluchim of the Rebbe all throughout the world, and they themselves are embodying this leadership that the Rebbe had. And this is really the whole idea of Chabad Chassidus, and this is what it was really all about, is is giving the followers the tools to become leaders. When you give the followers the like handbook on what is Chassidus from an intellectual standpoint, like the the uh, the toolkit or the technical guide, which is really what like the Tanya and other parts of other uh, Sfarim, other teachings of Chabad Chassidus really are, this gives the followers the tools to become leaders. So this is the message of today's Tanya is that the Altar Rebbe is saying, don't look to me, don't look to the Torah scholars as your gurus. We're not here to give you guidance on your material needs, on your physical needs, on your uh, bodily needs, things like that. We're here to give you spiritual guidance. The, the physical stuff, that's up to you. That's something that you got to figure out for yourself or, if, you know, maybe the realm of prophets, but we don't really have prophets nowadays, right? Now, the irony with all of this is that the Hasidim actually didn't listen to this advice. And they actually, throughout the generations, they continue to go to the Rebbe, to the Ultra Rebbe and to future Rebbeim for personal very physical requests. We we see this in our day and age, right? That people went to the Rebbe, when they went to the Rebbe for dollars, they didn't just ask him about spiritual related matters. They asked him for blessings in regard to very physical kind of things. And even nowadays, when people go to the Ohel, to the gravesite of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, people write in all kinds of physical worldly concerns all the time and ask for blessings and guidance in these matters all the time. So what's the deal with that, right? And it's in fact, it turns out that this uh, this rebellion, so to speak, of the Hasidim and continuation to neglect this, uh, this admonition of the Altar Rebbe to not ask him about these kind of things, it turns out that there is a good source for it and that ultimately... The Altar Rebbe himself elsewhere kind of actually spoke about this and spoke about how this is a good thing that people are doing this. So it's a little paradoxical. So like, what's the deal with that? So in today's Tanya, that it doesn't actually get resolved. Today's Tanya, we're going to be focusing on the negative aspect on don't do this. Don't worship your Rebbeim in the sense of expecting them to give you all of these material and physical blessings and answers and all of that. However, we know that elsewhere we we see that Hasidim have and that this behavior has been sanctioned. So, although that the resolution doesn't come up in today's Tanya itself, I'll offer a little bit of what I think the resolution is and um, what I understand from something that I actually learned about in relation to Rosh Hashanah, actually, which just was pretty recently, uh, where we see that there's a similar thing where the Gemara discusses this, that the Gemara talks about how there's a whole Sicha about this. I, I wish I could 
tell you guys exactly which sicha it was, but um, I don't remember offhand what year it was, but it was a whole sicha discussing the prayer of Hana, the, the famous prayer of Hana, and what it was that Eli the high priest was, why was he protesting the way that she was praying and her praying in general, and why did he eventually back down and sanction her prayer and actually see that it was a very positive thing. And in brief, so just to give you guys a background on that story for anybody, it's uh, is that the, there was this woman named Hana who was married to a man named Elkana who had another wife named Ptina. And Ptina had children, but Hana did not. And Hana was very upset about this. And she was so upset, in fact, that she went into the Mishkan, the tabernacle in Shiloh, and she started praying very fervently to give birth to a child. And the high priest saw her and saw her praying like this. And he, his first first thought was that she was drunk because she just looked like so you know she was so into the prayer that she just she, she looked like out of her mind and drunk and he thought this this was very disrespectful and there's a question he thinks she was actually physically drunk or drunk on prayer or whatever and he approached her and he told her to stop praying and that this was dis- disrespectful and then they had got into a whole argument and in the end he actually was convinced and he felt that her prayer was actually very holy and worthy of being listened to. And the whole discussion in the Sikha basically boils down to this idea that there is this concept that on Rosh Hashanah, which again, we just passed pretty recently, we're not supposed to be wasting our prayers on just asking God for physical things, for selfish things, like give me a lot of money this year, you know, make me have healthy children and all that kind of stuff like that's that that's very selfish and if we just pray in that manner it's like that's that's not what god's looking for us to pray for on rosh hashanah what we're really supposed to be focusing our prayers on is for more spiritual kind of things for our service of god for doing good things for other people for giving charity you know all that kind of stuff but the truth is when you get deeper into it when you get into the deeper essence of a Jew and who a Jew is this and this is the focus of the Sikha there is that the ultimate wish and will of a Jew even in terms of their physical needs and their physical wants really are all spiritual because ultimately we are the deepest part of ourselves is a part of God so why is it that a Jew wants money ultimately at the deepest level they want money in order to give tzedakah they want money in order to beautify Shabbos they want money in order to buy Tznia's clothing Right, we want healthy children in order to raise them to Torah and mitzvahs and those kind of things. So it turns out that all of these physical matters really are spiritual at the end of the day, really are for the sake of God, and that's the resolution to this whole question. So, but that's all of this is a little bit kind of it is off topic, but I did feel like it was important to mention in the context of what we're going to be learning about today. So keep that in mind when we get into the text that really the, what the altar is teaching people here is not to when he says don't come to me for these physical matters it's basically because he didn't he felt that it's like we shouldn't be so enmeshed and take physicality so seriously on the one hand like we shouldn't become we shouldn't be um wasting what this uh this opportunity that we have to be with a Rebbe, this opportunity that we have to ask a Rebbe for advice on just these puny mundane affairs. We should utilize this time to really focus on spirituality, on our spiritual growth, because this is really the role of a Rebbe. But I think that the fact that the Chassidim actually didn't listen to this and that the Chassidim actually ultimately like went ahead and asking the Rebbe for physical concerns and for guidance and all these things, it actually isn't a contradiction at all. It's actually because they recognize the fact that their physical concerns were spiritual concerns at the end of the day, were requests that related to their godly service. So that's how these things can kind of be resolved. So with that, with that being said, with this long introduction, I know, um, let's get into the text and see what the Altar Rebbe has to say about all of this. So again, for context, we are beginning a new epistle today. This is Epistle 22 of Yeras HaKodesh. And so here we go. So the Altar Rebbe begins, and again, he begins in a very loving way. He says, my beloved brethren and friends, out of my hidden love, I'm going to give you guys a rebuke. So he says, this is coming from love, but I am going to rebuke you guys. What is this rebuke? He says, he starts with a citation from Yeshayahu, chapter 1 verse 18 which means come now and let us debate and he says remember the days of old consider the years of every generation this is also a citation from devarim chapter 32 verse 7 
And he said, has it ever happened in the past? And where did you get this minhag from? Where did you, where does this custom come from? Um, is, does it come from any book, from any of the sages of Israel, that whether the Rishonim or the Achronim, the earlier sages or the later sages, to have this minhag, to have this custom and this established thing, this no- normalcy, to come and ask a, ask a Torah scholar for, uh, for advice on physicality? like what to do in terms of the physical world like where did this come from so he's basically saying like he's noticing this trend that people are coming to him with with asking him advice about physical concerns and he's like where are you getting this from and he says even the greatest of the sages of israel uh like the 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 Rishonim, like the Tanaim and the Amoraim, like these are the people, the Torah scholars who wrote the Mishnah and the Gemara, which for them, it's it says about them that Kol Raz lo anes lehu, that there was no secret that was hidden from them. And uh, this is this is a citation from the Gemara itself in Chulin, page 59a, that it teaches this, and where it says about them, Unahilin lehon shuvilin derakia, for whom all paths of heaven were clearly illuminated. This is from Brachos, page 58b. So even about about them, like these greatest scholars from the past, the greatest scholars, Jewish scholars that ever lived, even for them, people did not come to them with these physical concerns, with ath- asking them about physical matters. Um, but rather, this was the realm of the prophets, that for them, these prophets that used to live amongst the, the Jewish people, like for example, Shmuel, the the seer, who we see that Shaul actually went to him and he asked him about something to do with the donkeys that his father had lost. So there's a whole story about that in Shmuel Aleph, chapter nine, if you want to look it up. So basically that Shaul came to Shmuel, who was a prophet, and he asked him advice about his father's donkeys. So, okay, so that was a physical matter, but he went to a prophet about this, right? So, uh, so he says that, in fact, anything that relates to a person, except for things concerning Torah, and Yerat Shamayim, meaning fear of heaven, these are not understood except through prophecy. This is like basically anything in the outside of the realm of Torah, anything having to do with our lives is something that only can only be seen through prophecy. And he brings a citation for this from Eicha, chapter 9, verse 11, Lo lechachamim lechem. There is no bread unto the wise. So he interprets this to mean that it's wise people just, they can't see the future. It doesn't make a prophet and a, and a wise person are two separate things. And he says, like the sages taught, and this is a citation from the Gemara in Brachos, page 33b. Hakol shamayim, chutz shamayim. Everything is in the hands of heaven except for fear of heaven. So this is a very big principle in Judaism that everything is predetermined. Everything is outside of the realm of our choice except for our fear of God. And then there's another teaching also, this is from also from the Gemara in Psachim, page 54b, that there are seven things that are hidden from man. And the Altar Rebbe lists two of those seven things here. He lists the idea that one of these things is that a person doesn't know how he's going to earn a living, and a person doesn't know when the kingdom of David is going to be restored, meaning when Mashiach will come. And that these two things, these specific two things that he listed are related to one another. So just like a person has no idea when Mashiach is going to come, to that extent, does a person not know how they're going to earn a living. And now the ultra rapper says that, okay, but wait, we see that there's a, there's something that says in Yeshayahu chapter three, verse three, what does it say? It say, it says, that a counselor and a man whom silences them all, meaning to say that it, it, it seems to be implying that a counselor, uh, and, uh, and a chacham, like a wise person kind of knows something that nobody else has known, like silences everybody else. And also there's this, I, there's this teaching of the sages that we find in uh, Perke Avos in the beginning of chapter six, where it says, etzavetushia, that we enjoy from these wise people, uh, eta, counsel and wisdom. So meaning to say that there, it seems to be that we do get wisdom and advice from Torah scholars. So it's not like that. So what, what does this mean that we're getting advice? So the Alter Rebbe says this is specifically a concerning advice with matters of Torah. He says Tushia is specifically a type of assistance in regards to matters of Torah. And he says that, uh, and then he brings another teaching regarding this. 
And this is from Sanhedrin, page 87, that when we talk about a yoetz, when we talk about somebody who advises, this is somebody who knows how to calculate the different years and the months. Like, you know, when we're trying to figure out like Rosh Chodesh, like what the first day of the month is and the holidays and all of that, that uh, when we talk about this idea of, of calculating these things, we use these terms, itza, advice, and sod, secret, uh, this this is what the Torah uses, and this is written about in Sanhedrin. He says, page eighty seven, and he says, "Go look at the the explanation of Rashi there." So that's the end of the section. And so, just to sum it all up, so the ultra the main message of today's Tanya is the ultra Rabbi is admonishing his chassidim, and he's saying that this custom that has somehow developed of coming to a rabbi, coming to a Torah scholar such as himself, with matters, with questions, and looking for advice regarding worldly things, he says, this is not what I'm here for. This is not what the role of Torah scholars is supposed to be. This is the realm of prophets. And the role of Torah, Torah scholars is really there. They, they are there to help people with their service of God, with their spiritual lives, with their uh, Torah lives, how to best serve God in the best possible way, but not with worldly matters. So he's kind of like saying, do not waste my time with worldly matters. So that's the end of the section. And again, it's kind of like a funny kind of conclusion because we know that the Hasidim did not listen and they continued to come to the ultra Rebbe with with their uh, physical affairs and physical concerns and the ultra Rebbe actually in the end ended up sanctioning this uh so that's again we we dealt with that a little bit in the introduction um i believe it is addressed by the ultra Rebbe later on in the tanya so i think we will get to it at some point in the in the ultra Rebbe's words so stay tuned and we'll continue tomorrow with some more of this pistol that goes on for a little while and so i'll speak to you then thanks for listening to the it is top podcast hosted by sarit switzer this podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzchak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.